All right. So hello and welcome everyone to the seventh week of the course Computational Fluid Dynamics for Compressible Flows. So this course is being offered by NPTEL. It's being instructed by Professor Amoresh Dalal from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Guwahati. My name is Devjit. I'm a PhD scholar at IIT Madras and I'm the TA for this course. Like every other week, we shall be solving some problems together. Now, the seventh week of this course has, as you already know, has been entirely on the stability analysis of the different uh, solution schemes which we employ for uh, different, for, for solving different partial differential equations. So without any further ado, let's get down to the questions. This is question number one of today's session, which is asking us that which of these are ways to analyze the stability of a numerical scheme? Which of these are ways to analyze the stability of a numerical scheme? Yeah. If you have anything to say, please unmute and ask. You don't need to hesitate, but otherwise you can do it yourself. So we have... Uh, So we have four options here. Uh, option A is the discrete perturbation stability analysis. Option B is the matrix method stability analysis. Option C is the von Neumann stability analysis. And option D is all of the above. So we have uh, one quick response in favor of option D, that is all of the above. Let's see what others have to say. You can either type the answer in the chat box or you can unmute and answer as well. If you have any questions, you can uh, ask that as well. No need to hesitate. So we'll go back to question number one, which is asking us which of these are ways to analyze the stability of a numerical scheme. The discrete perturbation stability analysis, the matrix method stability analysis, the von Neumann stability analysis, or is it option D, all of the above. So we have a few responses in favor of option D and a few in favor of option C, the von Neumann stability analysis. Let's have a look at the solution. The solution is actually option D, all of the above. So all these three methods, the discrete perturbation stability analysis, the matrix method, as well as the von Neumann method, these are all different ways to uh, assess the stability of any numerical scheme for solving partial differential equations. Now, the uh, Scope of uh, under the scope of this this course, we study the von Neumann stability analysis, and uh, there are some <clears throat> pros and cons associated with it. So, it's actually applicable only for linear partial differential equations, and uh, it's really powerful and very easy. It gives us the stability criterion based on which we can uh, uh, decide which scheme to use, like the choice of the scheme as well as once you have chosen a scheme, the uh, time steps and the spatial discretizations to choose so that it remains within the stable regime because we have learned earlier that uh, any numerical scheme, it has to be uh, stable and consistent so that it reaches convergence, a converged solution is uh, what we finally want. So these things have to be kept in mind. Now, von Neumann stability analysis is a powerful tool which can give us results of stability for linear PDEs. But uh, another disadvantage is that it's only for periodic boundary conditions. So if there are uh, any other boundary condition, then there might be uh, some issues in the uh, 
locality of the boundary in that case there has to be a so locally uh, a system can be linearized and only in that region this analysis can be employed but then again that would be applicable only for those uh, local regions only for the entire domain things might change sir uh, what exactly i mean physically how we interpret uh, the periodic boundary conditions yeah so periodic boundary condition means so uh, if there is a circle like this and i am breaking it over here and i am stretching it in the form of a line like this so whatever solution i get here i will feed that into here so let's say if the variable i am solving for is phi and this is x x goes from 0 to l then uh, whatever is phi at 0 i'll feed that into phi at l so that this is a like periodic boundary that's what it means does that make sense y yes sir yes sir yeah. so it basically means that whatever i solve at one end i'll send that solution to another end so if you remember in one of the earlier lectures there was a wave equation which was solved with a boundary condition so the whatever wave was going out of x equal to l that same thing was coming back at x equal to 0 that sort of a thing okay any other questions okay so if there are no questions we'll move on to question number 2 now so this is again related to the uh, stability analysis which we study so the von neumann stability analysis is also known as what is it option a lorentz stability analysis option b fourier stability analysis option c linear stability analysis or option d all of the above okay so we have got one very quick response in favor of option c see what others have to say one in favor of option b Let's see what others have to say. Option C again, linear stability analysis. Okay, so let's have a look at the solution then. It's actually option B, Fourier stability analysis. Why is that? Because uh, in uh, von Neumann stability analysis, what we do is we consider that the error which is a function of space and time is actually a sum over uh different uh so it can be broken down into a fourier series like this i k m x where uh, i'm writing it in capital i this is basically the square root of minus 1 this is usually written with small i but i am using capital i because we often use this uh, small i for denoting our uh, uh, spatial locations the spatial indices index used is i so that's why capital i is used here and km is basically the wave number and so basically the error in any numerical scheme uh, can be uh, expressed as a, a sum of a fourier series and then since these are applied to linear partial differential equations so each term in the fourier series is independent of each other that's a property of linear problems right so each of them can be solved separately and then again added together to get the final solution so since a fourier series is used that's why this method is also known as the fourier stability analysis i hope that makes sense any questions anyone so another important property over here is that this amplitude of the fourier term which is a function of time can actually be written as some e to the power a into t but t is time and a is the growth rate 
this a this is the growth rate which can be a complex uh, number or uh, even a real number itself doesn't matter thing is the real part of this growth rate if it is greater than zero then what happens is the amplitude grows in time and if it's less than zero then it decays in time and this is what determines the growth rate of uh, each Fourier mode so to say and that's what determines whether the numerical scheme being used is stable or not and uh, the reason behind using this assumption that the amplitude is a exponential function is that errors have been seen to grow exponentially in case of unstable solutions so it makes sense that uh, each error mode would also grow in an exponential fashion that's why this ansatz is used and uh, that's why uh, and that's how we find out the growth rates and that determines the stability of the numerical scheme any questions on this okay so let's move along we'll move on to question number three now which is asking us that what are the minimum and maximum wavelengths of errors appearing in von neumann stability analysis with n grid points and delta x as the uniform grid spacing so the problem is very simple so let's say this is if this is our domain which uh, goes from x equal to zero to l let's say so and we are dividing it up into n different uh, uh, n different uh, grid points with an uniform spacing of delta x so if the total distance is l and we are using a spacing of delta x, then delta x would basically be l divided by capital f okay so now and another thing is that we saw that the errors can be split into uh, a Fourier series like this, right? e to the power i k m into x. So this km is the wave number and this is associated with a wavelength as well. You have to find out what is the minimum wavelength and the maximum wavelength possible in such a case. Is it option A? the delta x and n delta x is it option b pi by delta x and pi by n delta x is it option c delta x by pi and n delta x by pi or is it option d 2 delta x and n delta x so and the order here is that the first one should be the minimum and the second one has to be the maximum There is no hurry, take your time. And once you have figured out the correct solution, you can type it in the chat box or you can unmute and answer as well. Is the session being recorded? Yes, it's being recorded. I hope it's being recorded, otherwise I'll have to do it again. Option A, delta x and n delta x. Okay, we have one response in favor of this. 
Let's see what others have to say. Yeah, so the sessions are, all the sessions that we have are being recorded and they are being uploaded in YouTube as well. And there is a link for the YouTube channel given in the course page. I hope you all can access it. Otherwise, if you want, I can share the link to the playlist as well. You can always go back and look at these sessions whenever you feel that you need to. In the course page, under problem solving sessions, you can find the link to the YouTube channel. Okay, any more responses? Okay, what are the response in favor of option D? Two delta x and n delta x. So, if we take a look at this, uh, this uh, domain which we drew over here, so and with uniform spacing delta x, we can see that the minimum wave that can form is something like this, between two grid points only. Basically using three grid points with the spacing as two delta x. So delta x here and delta x there. So the total distance between this is two delta x. This is the minimum wavelength possible because it can't be shorter than that. If, if there is any wave between only two grid points, we can't really resolve that, right? Because it has to go through a maxima and a minima, a crest and a trough, so to say. And uh, the uh, maximum wavelength which it can form is covering uh, the entire domain from 0 to L. So let's say, uh, how many have I drawn here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six, seven, eight. So, I'll just use this point. This is the maximum length it can cover, and that is the entire L. So, basically, the minimum is 2 delta x, and the maximum is L. Now, L can also be from this equation, I can show you that L can be written as n into delta x. So the maximum is n into delta x. And this combination is given where? We can find it in option D. So let's have a look at the solution. It's actually option D. 2 delta x and n delta x. <clears throat> Does that make things clear? Any questions on this? Sir, uh, yeah. is the physical significance of uh, wave number hmm. K? Yeah. KM. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, wave number is nothing but just a different way of telling what the wavelength is. The wave number tells that within a phase of 2 pi, how many waves are there? So, uh, the what we do is we divide 2 pi with the wavelength. That's all, nothing else. So if I ask you what is the wavelength, if the wave number is so and so, you can simply say that the wavelength is just 2 pi by km. That's it, nothing else. So km is basically, uh, the unit is per unit length. So it would be meter inverse, whereas the SI unit for wavelength would be meter. Wavelength tells you that what is the length of one wave and wave number tells you that per unit length, how many waves are there? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah? So yes. let's say for the uh, maximum wavelength case, the N delta X or L. So there the wavelength is L and the wave number is 2 pi by L. 
So if L was uh, 1 meter, then 2 pi by 1 would be the wave number. The wave number would be 2 pi. Right. It's just a different way of uh, representing things, nothing else. Anyway, any other questions? Anyone? Okay. So let's move along. We'll move on to question number four now, which is a okay. So here four steps of one of the of the von Neumann stability analysis is given. You have to arrange them in the correct order. So they are not in the correct order. The first step is written as check whether amplification factor is less than one. Uh, step two is determine amplification factor or growth rate. Step three is expand the error in its Fourier series. And step four is write the error expression from the finite difference equation. What is the correct order in which von Neumann stability analysis is performed? Figure out the correct order. And once you have done so, you can pick them from the options given below. The options are option A, 1, 2, 3, 4. Option B, 4, 3, 2, 1. Option C, 1, 4, 3, 2. And step D or option D is uh, 2, 3, 4, 1. Okay, we have one quick response in favor of option B. So it's telling us that the reverse order, 4, 3, 2, 1 should be the correct order. Let's see what others have to say. Okay, we have another response in favor of option B, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's have a look at the solution. Solution is right, so well done, both of you. <laughs> it's actually the reverse order in which we have to do things. So the first step is from the fi finite difference equation. So from the PD, once we have figured out a numerical scheme, we can figure out what the finite difference equation is. And we have seen that this finite difference equation is uh, actually satisfied by the error as well as the exact solution to the finite difference equation as well. So the numerical solution, which is d plus epsilon, this is also satisfied by the, or the finite difference equation is also satisfied by this. So if we write down everything, basically we can replace the uh, actual parameters with the error and replace them in the finite difference finite difference equation that's how we get the error expression first so it looks like something like this so it could be let's say if we're using the ftcs scheme for an hyperbolic equation suppose so in that case it will be something like this epsilon i n plus one and epsilon i n divided by delta t should be equal to minus c into delta x 2 delta x because let's say we are using if we are using a central difference so then i plus 1 minus epsilon i minus 1 n so this is the first step we write down uh, the error expression then we expand them in its Fourier series we don't really have to do that we can uh, divide this equation by the lowest order of epsilon so let's say uh, Okay, no, we do have to do that. It makes things easier. So, the epsilon i n can be written as the summation over m of a m into t into, okay, and a m t we will now write as e to the power a into uh, a n into delta t. And 
the spatial term is like this kmx and we will do this for only one m and uh, that's how we will get an expression so this we will plug in here for e to the power n e, e to the power n i i plus one i minus one n plus one all of them that's the second step the expansion of error in Fourier series so let's say in this case if I do things explicitly we will get something like this for n plus 1 we will get t plus delta t and uh, plus i k m x minus e to the power a n t plus i k m x divided by delta t this is the left hand side and equal to c divided by 2 delta x the numerator would be so both would be a n t plus now this would be i k m x plus delta x and this one would be x minus delta x right then we will divide this entire thing by the uh, common term and finally we will the main thing that we need to find out is the amplification factor G, which is epsilon i n plus 1 divided by epsilon i n. This would basically take the form e to the power a n delta t only. Right. And this would have some expression in terms of other, uh, other terms in the equation. But anyway. So this is what we actually have to find. We have to determine the ampli amplification factor or the growth rate. That's the third step. Then we just have to check whether the absolute value of this G is less than equal to one or not. If it's less than one, then it's stable. Otherwise it's unstable. So this is the correct order of performing the von Neumann stability analysis. Any questions on this? The exact algebra would differ from numerical scheme to numerical scheme and that's why the stability criteria will also be different. But the main uh, steps that we have to take uh, is this. We have to write the error expression first, then we have to expand the error terms in their Fourier series, then we will take only one term. We won't do this for all values of m. For any given value of m, we will solve this, any arbitrary value, we will just keep m as n, that's it. Then we will find out that, uh, uh, then we will find out what the amplification factor or the growth rate is. Then we will see what are the conditions under which this value is less than 1. Sorry, so this won't be less than equal to 1, it has to be less than 1. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so if there are no questions, we'll move on to question number five now, which is asking us that what is the stability criterion for the beta scheme for parabolic equations? if beta is between 0 and half. So beta scheme if we remember a little bit, uh, it's, the, it's a combination of FTCS and BTCS. This is the implicit part and this is the explicit part. And beta is the weighing factor of the two. Is it gamma x less than 1 by 2 into 1 minus 2 beta? Is it 1 by 1 minus 2 beta? Is it 1 by 2 into 1 minus beta? Or is it 1 by 2 into 1 plus 2 beta? Okay. 
right, we have a quick response in favor of option A. Let's see what others have to say. We have another response in favor of option B. That is, gamma x should be less than 1 by 1 minus 2 beta. Let's see what others have to say. All right, so let's have a look at the solution. It's actually option A. Gamma x should be less than 1 by 2 into 1 minus 2 beta. So from von Neumann stability analysis of the beta scheme for parabolic equations, we finally reach a stage where the stability criterion, that is uh, g less than 1, is actually given by this gamma x. And just for remembering, gamma x is nothing but capital gamma into delta x by, uh, is it meter square per second? So, gamma into delta t divided by delta x square. So, this gives us uh, gamma x into uh, 1 minus 2 beta into side square of, I won't write this as beta, so let's say I'll call this as theta by 2, where uh, this theta is, okay, so let's just complete this. This, this should be less than 1. So theta over here is given by, I can't remember this. Um, it came from km something. This is a function of the uh, wave number being used. But uh, anyway, it's immaterial because uh, sine squared of anything is actually less than 1 and remains between 0. It always has to be positive because it's squared. So and this has to be less than half, sorry. So this basically boils down to gamma x into 1 minus 2 beta has to be less than half. And gamma x has to be less than 1 by 2 into 1 minus 2 beta. This is a sufficient condition, not a necessary condition, because remember that it's multiplied by the by a sine square as well. So if it's less than 1, then gamma x can actually be greater than this, yet the numerical scheme would be stable. But if gamma is less than this itself, the value given on the right hand side here, then this is a sufficient condition that it has to be stable. Does that make sense what I just said? This was not discussed in the lectures by the way. So this is a sufficient condition, not a necessary one. This condition is necessary. This is necessary. But this one is sufficient. I hope that makes sense. Any questions if you have, please ask. So just for finishing what I had started to say, there it was 
uh, e to the power i k m x minus some e to the power i k m x or minus I guess. So in this case we can use the Moivre's theorem and then get uh, if, if it was plus then some cos of two cos of k m x and this is what we call theta yeah same delta x so the theta which we spoke about over here is nothing but k m into delta x any questions on this okay so we'll move along we'll move on to question number six now what is the expression for artificial viscosity in first order upwind scheme for first order wave equation so the first order wave equation is given by this dou phi dot e equal to minus c dou phi dou x <coughs> sorry <coughs> and first order upwind scheme tells us that if c is positive then uh, this dou phi dou x has to be uh, discretized as phi into phi uh, i minus i minus 1 because upwind we have to use the uh, points upstream uh, of that point in order to uh, calculate the spatial derivatives and dou phi dou t uh, in a simple uh, forward difference manner. and lambda is the current number this is something which we saw earlier as well so the current number is given by c delta x divided by sorry c delta t divided by delta x so we saw that in these cases we can find out the modified equations and in those modified equations as a result of using this first order upwinding we introduce something called an artificial artificial viscosity what is the expression of that is it option a alpha equal to c delta x by 2 into lambda is it option b c delta x by 2 into lambda into 1 minus lambda is it c delta x by 2 into 1 plus lambda or is it c delta x by 2 into 1 minus lambda So I'll give some more hints over here. So basically, due to the discretization scheme that we use, we actually introduce another term in the uh, right hand side of the equation, which is given by this alpha into some second derivative of phi. This alpha is the artificial viscosity. What is the expression of that? It's uh, no doubt order of delta x because uh, we have used a uh, uh, ft bs discretization over here forward in time and backward in space ft bs so that's why the truncation errors are del are order delta x and delta t but uh, it has a dependency on the current number as well <coughs> Okay, so we have a one response in favor of option D. Let's see what others have to say. Okay, so let's just have a look at the solution. It's actually option D. So the dependency on one minus lambda is actually 
very dangerous because see due to the presence of this artificial viscosity we are introducing some errors in our solution what happens is known as a dissipation dissipation solution so if the correct solution should have been like this we get a solution something like this so it basically the gradients get smoothed down that's what diffusion does but uh, so and this is the dependence of that term on lambda the current number now as we saw that current number has to be less than one in order to keep the uh, numerical scheme stable in many cases this is the stability criterion for many uh, hyperbolic equations now as a, as lambda goes lesser and lesser than 1 this term over here 1 minus lambda increases so as lambda decreases 1 minus lambda increases and since alpha is directly proportional to this alpha also increases and that increases this diffusion artificial diffusion problem even more that's why in uh, practice uh, first order upwind schemes are not used there are higher order upwind schemes which takes care of these issues those are used one such example is a quick scheme we will learn about this in uh, some of the later lectures in this course okay any questions on this All right, so let's move along. We we'll move on to question number seven now. Okay, this is a conceptual question which is asking us where does this artificial viscosity which we just talked about originate from? Is it the round off error which brings in artificial viscosity? Is it the truncation error or is it the discretization error? So just to give a refresher on what these errors are, so let's say if there is a PDE, the partial differential equation, and we have made a finite differential equation out of it as well. Now the exact solution of the PDE if we write that as let's say E and exact solution of FDE with a computer with infinite accuracy let's call that D and <coughs> the actual numerical solution obtained by uh, a, a computer with a finite uh, accuracy let that be n now there is a difference between this d minus n this is known as the round of error because of the finite accuracy of the computer there are some numbers beyond uh, uh, many digits of the decimal system some of them are truncated and that's known as the round of error and the difference between the exact solution of the fd and the pd so d minus e or rather e minus d because e is the correct one this is known as the discretization error because uh, as a result of discretizing a pd into an F fde we had introduced this error and truncation error is the difference between the pd and the fd itself so that is something which we have seen earlier. So let's say do phi do d equal to minus c do phi do x. We discretize this into some phi n plus 1 minus phi n divided by delta t equal to c plus delta x phi let's say i minus phi i minus 1 
these are both at n and these are at i then there is a truncation error obviously there while converting the FDA to PD. So where does this artificial viscosity originate from? Is it round of error, truncation error, discretization error? Okay, <clears throat> so let's have a look at the solution. It's actually option C, the discretization error. Because, uh, so let's go back. So the difference between the uh, exact solution of the PD and that of the FD is where the difference lies. So, and uh, that basically becomes something like uh, an additional viscosity plus some higher order derivatives and this is where the artificial viscosity originates from okay all right so moving on to the eighth question of today's solution uh, today's session what is or are the effect or effects so i'm using this because there could be either one or multiple answers to this question so what are the effects of artificial viscosity on the solution is it option a numerical dispersion is it option b numerical dissipation is it option c both a and b or is it option d none of the above You can either type it in the chat box or you can unmute and answer as well, whichever way you feel comfortable. <clears throat> the artificial viscosity actually brings in something known as the numerical diffusion. And there are multiple parts of diffusion. One of them is dispersion. And the other one is dissipation. What does dispersion look like in an actual scenario? So if let's say the correct solution would have been something like this, then dispersion actually spreads it out like this. So maybe I'll draw it in a better way. It actually spreads it out. The gradients become smooth instead of a sharp gradient, which is present over here. We get a smoothened one spread over multiple points. This is known as dispersion. And what is dissipation? So in a similar case where the correct solution should have been a sharp gradient jump like this we get something like this a few wiggles so 
so these are actually the description terms used for the effects of dissipation and dispersion this is known as wiggles as you can see in this these regions and this is known as smearing so as if the sharp gradient has been smeared across uh, the locality of that sharp jump so as i have already told the correct wait a second it should be both right ah okay sorry so in the modified equations if there are those additional terms only the ones near uh, only the uh, terms in front of even derivatives of phi this is known as the artificial viscosity this is the artificial viscosity and uh, smearing sort of problems the dispersion problems is only brought about by these uh, even order terms and this sort of wiggles arise out of odd derivatives so the correct answer should have been dispersion the answer given here is wrong i apologize for that yeah good evening sir good evening how are you good evening sir sir Sorry, sir. Fine, sir. Actually, uh, I thought that called class at seven. As you used to, it is seven. So I just see it and see that is class in six. Sorry for that, late, sir. Hey, it's okay. No problem. Uh, the okay, sir. Okay. Will be uploaded. You can take a look if you want. Sure, 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 sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, unless uh, you know informed otherwise by the NPTEL team, we will stick to this timings only, six to eight. Okay. So I hope there are no questions regarding this. If you have, please go ahead and ask. All right. So we'll move on to the ninth question of today's session, which is asking us that uh, match the following. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll go back. Yeah. So this is dissipation. Sorry. The smearing is actually dissipation, and these are caused by uh, even order terms. And uh, problems of dispersion is caused by odd order terms. This is known as uh, dispersion. So the artificial viscosity, which comes before the second derivative. that actually brings about a dissipation problem so that's why option b would have been the correct solution over here okay right. okay we'll move on to question number 9 now plus i please yeah let's go back sorry for creating the confusion it's actually uh, this is the right way of doing things so in modified equations if so there will be uh, second order terms as well as third order terms and higher order terms as well so all the even order terms the coefficient of them are known as artificial viscosity and they cause problems like this this one smearing where a sharp gradient is spread over a region and if there are odd order terms then they cause the problem of dispersion which is the creation of wiggles around uh, sharp gradients any questions on this i i'm sorry i messed up a little bit in the beginning but uh, this is correct as it is written right now so if you have any questions please clarify them right now
Okay. All right. So moving on, we'll move on to question number nine now, which is a match the following type of question. So in modified equations, uh, which terms bring about what effect? Is it the even terms which bring about dissipation or dispersion, or odd terms which bring about dissipation or di dispersion? So this is something that we immediately discussed. So everyone will be able to answer this. No, sir, no, sir. So what would be the solution to this? Will it be even terms dissipation or even terms dispersion or the other way around? Or odd terms dissipation and odd terms? Option A, A1, B2. We just discussed this. Let's have a look at solution. It's actually A1, B2. So nothing new. Even terms bring about dissipation, also known as smearing. And odd terms bring about dispersion, also known as the creation of wiggles. So both create problems, problems of different kinds. Okay, so now moving on to the last question of today's session, we have to now match. Okay, so <laughs> once again, I gave you the answer. So we have to match smearing at wiggles with dissipation and dispersion. Quickly, come on, we just discussed this now. Yeah. Once again, option A, smearing is brought about by dissipation and dispersion brings about wiggles. Okay, so I am done from my side. Thank you all for joining today and uh, attending this session. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Sir, can you go back to question number 10? Yeah, sure. There we are. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. So we will meet again at 6 o'clock next week. Until then, goodbye, good night, take care. Thank you.